Sherlock Holmes was a phenomenon of his age. His creator, Arthur Conan Doyle, became the highest paid author of his generation, and from the stories forged a new form of popular fiction. And yet, having produced such a character, beloved by a nation, in 1891, at the height of his popularity, his creator brought the series to an abrupt end. Why get rid of Sherlock Holmes? The stories were actually reflecting his own life much more, perhaps, than we realise, and he may have been a little worried that he was giving away rather too much. The character of Sherlock Holmes undoubtedly um, took over Conan Doyle's life, and it irritated Conan Doyle immensely. He decided he would do the ultimate to his character and, um, well, kill him off. It has been suggested more than once that the inconsistencies in the stories were deliberately put in by the author as a sort of code leading to some sort of revelation. An investigation of Conan Doyle's relationship with Sherlock Holmes asks more questions than it answers. Was there something disturbing behind the story of his invention? What made a young doctor from Edinburgh produce this giant of a literary character, a character that has been performed and portrayed more than any ever created? This is a journey into the world of Conan Doyle to discover the truth behind his love-hate relationship for the detective creation that would become his most valuable meal ticket. We'll investigate the untold story of the relationship between the man and his creation and ask the question, what was it that made him determined to kill off the character who had dominated his life for so long in one dramatic episode? Any attempt to find a real place absolutely could possibly fit to be in such a situation. We are really going to lock each other's arms. We're going to track down the people and the influences that lay behind the creation of what is without doubt literature's most enduring fictional character. And we're going to ask the question why, having created such a successful and acclaimed detective, why does his creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, become anxious to kill off his creation? Why would Conan Doyle want to rid himself of the character of Sherlock Holmes? Did he, in fact, give away more of himself than he meant to through the adventures of his famous character? What was he revealing about his own life? And does this fictional murder reveal a darker side to an untold story behind the legend? It's possible that the world's greatest detective is based on a cocktail of disturbing influences in the author's early life. Well, I'm absolutely convinced myself that, yes, indeed, Sherlock Holmes is based on a, a real character to a large extent. When you're doing your first novel, you generally want to base it on either yourself or somebody you know very well. He's also been described as not so much a character as a collection of characteristics, but it's those characteristics which bring him to life. Dr. Watson does write of him in convincing detail. Does this therefore mean that there's a lot of a real person in him? Well, actually, yes, it probably does. The sense of a real person in the Sherlock Holmes character is what leads many to this day to believe that he really existed. Well, I've just left Baker Street Station and I'm walking along one of the most famous streets in the world, Baker Street in London. And here on the left is one of the world's best known addresses, 221B Baker Street. This is the address Conan Doyle gave to his character and where people, despite him being fictional, still come today caught up in the myth. Conan Doyle once said that he'd never been to London when he started writing the Sherlock Holmes stories. In fact, he had been to London when he was a boy of about seven or eight. As a child, he visited family in London and they went to visit, he records it in letters to his mother, they went to visit Madame Tussauds 
which at that time was not in Marylebone Road, it was in Baker Street. If you go to his library, you will find tourist map of London. And from that, I very much suspect he just picked a street at random and said, this is where my, my character will live. In truth, there never actually was a 221B Baker Street, albeit today, here on the west side of the street, there is a museum dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. But in all honesty, the address, the location, the rooms, even the bay window from which Holmes and Watson would look down on the daily traffic along Baker Street were a pure fiction created by Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle. The story of Conan Doyle's own life and his path to the creation of Holmes is in itself something of an enigma and one which leads 400 miles north of London where the stories are set to Edinburgh, Scotland's capital city. The thing is, everyone thinks of Sherlock Holmes as being a London character. Obviously, his adventures are written for the streets of London, but it's in fact these streets that we're walking in now, the streets of Edinburgh, that really did provide in many ways the original backcloth against which Conan Doyle wrote the adventures. These streets, the streets of the infamous murderers, Burke and Hare, of Deacon Brodie, of Major Weir, characters who influenced Robert Louis Stevenson's creation of Dr. Jekyll, and Mr Hyde. So it's here in the streets of Edinburgh that Sherlock Holmes was born. Conan Doyle's early life was turbulent and unsettled and bore little resemblance to the well-off, ordered world of his London gentleman detective. Conan Doyle was born here in Edinburgh in Piccadilly Place where we're now standing on the 22nd of May 1859. He was the third child and eldest son of Charles and Mary Conan Doyle. His family were of Anglo-Irish Catholic descent and not particularly well off. His father Charles Altamont Doyle, a talented artist, was a chronic alcoholic suffering from depression and epilepsy. Charles Altamont Doyle was a fantastic artist, wonderful drawings like um, all sorts of fairies and spirits emanating from the spire of St. Giles Cathedral. He was epileptic and alcohol had a very fast and very debilitating effect upon him, sometimes quite frightful. He would try to sell his clothes, he would sell anything at the house to get drink, the mother would find herself bringing home uh, virtually an inert corpse who sometimes could become violent. You do find the theme of drunkenness constantly coming into the story, sometimes drunkenness accompanying great brutality. One story in particular which turns on an alcoholic husband who murders his wife and her lover may have been all too closely reminiscent of the tragedy of Conan Doyle's own early life and that of his parents. In short, Mr. Holmes, you would go far before you found a more dangerous man than Peter Kemp. He was known in the trade as Black Peter. Her name was given. The alcoholic husband turns up time and again in the Sherlock Holmes stories. It's possibly the most obvious effect of his own family life on the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, Charles Doyle ended his days in a, a sanatorium. Throughout his childhood, the family moved from address to address as their financial situation and Charles's condition are deteriorated. Doyle's mother, Mary, was desperate to keep the young Arthur away from his father's destabilizing influence. In 1868, the nine-year-old Doyle was sent to a Jesuit boarding school in England. His family were devout Catholics. He grew up with the Catholic faith ringing in his ears, and he was educated at Hodder and Stonyhurst, which were Jesuit schools. But another particular influence on him was his mother's tales of chivalry. 
She regaled her children with stories of knights and fair maidens. And Conan Doyle's legendary chivalry is recounted by his own children. While appealing to the imaginative side of the future writer, these heroic fantasies may also have been an escape for the young Conan Doyle from the reality of his own harsher environment. Conan Doyle had been brought up quite poor, and he was the leader of a street gang in Edinburgh. He brought that in in one of the earliest Sherlock Holmes stories for the Baker Street Irregulars. In an effort to provide for his family, he applied for a place at Edinburgh to study medicine. While his application was successful, he was far from the typical student. While studying medicine at the University of Edinburgh, Conan Doyle lodged here in George Square, now surrounded by university buildings. In fact, they still have a plaque on the wall here that commemorates his tenure. He left here in 1880 to embark upon the greatest adventure of his young life, an adventure that he later recalled would turn him into a man. It was drilled into him, you must do well, he must go into a profession, and what better profession to go into than a doctor because you'll be uh, comfortable for the rest of your life. And I, I mean, he always said he hated Stony House. He didn't particularly like Edinburgh University, and he regarded it more of a, a, a drudgery to get through it, but he didn't actually particularly like, like the work and didn't find it particularly easy either. Although still studying, on the morning of February the 28th, 1880, Conan Doyle joined the crew of the Greenland whaler, Hope, on a voyage of several months in the dangerous occupation of seal and whale hunting. He returned to Edinburgh with a 50 pound share of the crew's profits. This period of his life was to have a profound effect on the young man. I went on board the whaler, a big struggling youth, but came off a powerful one grown man. Um, he certainly didn't pass uh, you know, out of Edinburgh with, with flying colours. He was rejected for every single hospital appointment he went for and was forced almost to go on whaling ships and so on to earn his money because it was only a certain type of person who would go on a, a whaling ship to this you know, austere, uh, hard life that it was. With these very different life experiences under his belt, he returned to Edinburgh to resume his studies at the medical school. He could have no idea that his time here was to give him the inspiration for the creation of homes. It was commonplace for students to undertake extramural studies, which Conan Doyle did. In the course of those studies, he encountered the man who more than any other would become a true inspiration for the character of Sherlock Holmes. And that man was Dr. Joseph Bell. He first met uh, Bell because he taught Conan Doyle clinical surgery at Edinburgh University. And he was a very popular um, uh, surgeon there. He'd have packed audiences of the students, and not only would he uh, show them the surgery techniques, but he'd make various deductions and observations about the, uh, the people he was dealing with. It was noted by many who knew Bell that the eminent lecturer's physical attributes were remarkably similar to those of the fictional Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle has recorded his memories of Bell, uh, who was thin, high-nosed, uh, eagle-faced, and had a jerky way of walking and a high, strident voice. Well, Holmes's voice isn't mentioned in descriptive terms very often, but when you go back to the stories, it is described as a high, strident voice, just like Joseph Bell. Many of Sherlock Holmes's other characteristics seem to relate directly back to Bell, the character of the poet, sportsman, and birdwatcher. However, most significantly, in relation to Sherlock Holmes, there is also the fundamental feature of his famously brilliant diagnostic mind. Joe Bell was not just a medical diagnostician, uh, which he was brilliant at. He was also a master of looking at a person and being able to tell their trade, uh, their place of residence, their status in life. Sherlock Holmes is best known for his deductive reasoning, and that was something very much that came from Conan Doyle's medical training. Joseph Bell is known to have used that sort of argument. He would look at clues from just seeing the complaint and things about the patient. Bell could work out a lot about his background. Doyle probably first met Bell 
Now, in 1878, at a clinical surgery outpatient class. The students were present and the first patient was shown in. Before the patient could open his mouth, Bell said to the patient, Ah, my man, I see you have been in the army. Aye, Aye sir. Not long discharged. Uh, Non-commissioned officer, Highland Regiment, recently stationed in Barbados. And when asked you know, how on earth he could know all of these things, Bell says, you see, gentlemen, the man was respectful, but did not remove his hat. They do not do that in the army, but he would have learned civilian ways had he not long been discharged. He has an air of authority, and he's obviously Scottish. As to Barbados, his complaint is elephantitis, which is West Indian and not British. Well, the students, of course, love this performance. Well, that's what it was. This was him showing them how to be observant. Doyle remembered all that and noted it down and came to use it years and years later when he created Sherlock Holmes. Although elements of Bell are clearly in Holmes's behavior, and Conan Doyle seems to have acknowledged this in a letter he wrote to his old professor, there is ample evidence that Holmes is also influenced by other people he encountered during his student life. But he actually embodied several people, especially in the very early stages. He drew on these several people to make Holmes, but after he'd drawn on them, Holmes began to move by himself. We're here in Dean Cemetery, some distance from the centre of Edinburgh and the university's medical faculty. And over by a boundary wall of the cemetery is the grave of Dr. Joseph Bell, to whom Conan Doyle said he owed Sherlock Holmes. Holmes and scholars would seem to be in agreement because in all honesty, the only real similarity between Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Joseph Bell is Holmes's amazing ability for deduction. So the benign character of Bell may not have been the strongest influence in the creation of Sherlock Holmes. Looking further into Conan Doyle's life, more disturbing influences behind the character begin to emerge. Is there a darker side to this story? Well, in 1875, a man by the name of Dr. Brian Charles Waller had become the Doyle's lodger. And it seems to have been he that was influential in persuading Conan Doyle to study medicine. Indeed, Brian Charles Waller would become one of the early influences for the real Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes has a dark side to him. It's been suggested that this is influenced by a man whom Conan Doyle must have known fairly well, Brian Charles Waller. As the Doyle's uh, financial situation worsened due to Charles Doyle's heavy drinking, the rent which Waller paid to the Doyle family uh, no doubt saved them from the workhouse. Brian Charles Waller, who was medical doctor of pathology and was seeking a place in the university, and called himself a consulting pathologist. And in fact, Conor Doyle would use that initially to launch Sherlock Holmes, that Holmes was a consulting detective. He was also a very bossy individual, uh, extremely full of himself, quite sure that he knew the answers, very rapid in his decisions, and in certain ways, so aware of how much he knew as to be positively dislikable. One of the important things that Brian Charles Waller put into the character of Sherlock Holmes was the aspects of him which are not likable. Watson begins by disliking Holmes quite a good deal and is conquered by discovering that Holmes actually isn't a charlatan, that there is a great deal in his work. Waller seems to have been quite a good doctor, a good research doctor, although as a commentator on other doctors, he was vicious beyond belief. And in fact, Holmes' rudeness about everybody, from the creations of Edgar Allan Poe to the Scotland Yard inspectors, is very much taken from Waller. Whether or not Holmes was influenced by Waller, Conan Doyle's relationship with him appears to have been very complex and possibly disturbing for him. I'm not sure that Arthur Conan Doyle got on very well with Waller. He was a big, big influence on the family. What we do know definitely is that Mary Doyle, 
Conan Doyle's mother, after her husband died, moved from Edinburgh, in fact was given a cottage in Yorkshire on Brian Charles Waller's estate. He lived at the big house, she lived in the cottage. He may have been in love with Conan Doyle's elder sister. There are some signs that he was. He wrote a poem about her music, but he may also have been in love with Conan Doyle's mother. Waller evidently got on very well with Mrs. Doyle, but another curious fact is that one of his sisters, and mark this, his sisters, was named Brian. Could it be that the Waller influences in Sherlock Holmes were behind Doyle's murder of his character, that this was a fictional attempt to get rid of a disturbing aspect of his life? It's conceivable that this could be one of the reasons behind the murder of Sherlock Holmes. Accusations of adultery may have been made, whether there was anything to it is, I think, very doubtful, but certainly Conan Doyle may have feared that there really was a physical relationship between his mother and Brian Charles Waller, and it certainly would account for it as resenting Waller more and more. Surely such family arrangements, together with his father's incarceration in the asylum, must have had a profound psychological effect on the younger Conan Doyle. Because of such early psychological experiences, his father's descent, Waller's influence, and the hardships of his early life, Conan Doyle unsurprisingly brought darker elements to the character of Holmes that could be found disturbing. Holmes has been described as a manic depressive, and there certainly is evidence for heavy mood swings in the stories. A lot has been made of the fact that he took cocaine and occasionally morphine. Watson reports that when Holmes was bored and his mind not challenged, he took cocaine in a 7% solution. This was not a heavy dose, but it was clearly enough to be habit-forming. Dr. Watson, on several occasions, warns Holmes against taking cocaine, but he continued to do it. Oh, yeah, it's a very dangerous substance, and it would be very quickly addictive to it. This unsettling aspect of the Holmes character has many questioning the author's motives for representing his hero as flawed and fallible. But the connections to his early life seem to emerge clearly. There, of course, it's a euphemism for Conan Doyle's father's drink. So for Holmes to be on cocaine, not altogether surprising. That Holmes had a serious addiction, all Watson's descriptions of Holmes' nervous activity makes clear. The restlessness, the ability to work for days without adequate sleep and even without rest at all. Abrupt changes of mood and equally abrupt descents into a comatose state. All tend to suggest the extended use of a strong narcotic. In addition to the psychological influences on the shaping of the Sherlock Holmes character, there is also the society itself in which Holmes is set and the stories unfold. Conan Doyle could not have failed to be aware of the darker aspects of the time in which he lived. Victorian society in the late 19th century was faced apparently with success and yet with a constant fear of things going wrong. The Sherlock Holmes stories are set between 1881 and 1903. During this time, the latter part of the Victorian period, the British Empire was at its zenith, and London was the centre of all things. However, despite the apparent stability of the empire, many felt that this was the final chapter of an era. There is a paradox about Sherlock Holmes. What is the extraordinary quality that makes this eccentric 19th century Victorian detective such a phenomenon? What was it about him that so gripped the Victorian public's imagination? There seems to have been something in these stories that met a need in society as it entered the exciting, different, yet frightening world of the 20th century. A century that threatened to pull apart the fabric of everything that was known and everything that had seemed certain. Readers of Sherlock Holmes' short stories were drawn by the reassurance of the all-knowing detective who would always make things right in the end. Even then, 
people were starting to get railways, the London Underground had started, motor car was coming in later on into the new century. But the world of the Sherlock Holmes stories is gaslight and handsome cabs, trains, yes, steam trains. But people aren't looking at modern technology. And I think people were looking back to an earlier, safer age when they were on the brink of really quite a social revolution. The Holmes short stories took off and became celebrated in the 1890s, a time when London was mushrooming at tremendous speed and very frighteningly for the average reader of a magazine who would find within this magazine a series of stories about a man who could make sense out of an enormous howling metropolitan wilderness who worked on sound professional grounds and professionalism was coming in more and more. Somebody who wasn't official and the adventure, the omniscience, the professionalism, the science, all opening up an exciting new world while making sense of the frightening one that exists. And so it was in the autumn of 1887, prior to the arrival of Jack the Ripper on the streets of Whitechapel the following year. London was ready for the arrival of the brilliant but eccentric detective Sherlock Holmes. And certainly as far as uh, villains were, were concerned, the readers would be familiar uh, from uh, the press of people like Jack the Ripper and therefore had a, a belief in people with ultimate evil and the dreadful crimes that they could commit and they would draw upon these experiences when reading the Sherlock Holmes stories when, uh, when Watson would write about people who was the worst man in London or you know, an evil person and so on. The dark and the light would have been the everyday fare for Colin Doyle, now practicing as a junior doctor in Southdee in southern England. During the long wait for patients in his consulting room, he did write stories and later recalled how he divided his time between his patients and literature. It is hard to say which suffered most. There is Conan Doyle, uh, new in his medical practice in South Sea. Not that many patients during the summer months, uh, mainly full in the winter months with cough and colds and that, that sort of thing. So during those long periods, he started to write. He wrote a few letters to newspapers and a few short articles, but he had aspirations to write a novel. After several early rejections, Holmes appeared for the first time in a 200-page novel with the title A Study in Scarlet. Conan Doyle found an unusual outlet for its debut, the 1887 edition of the colourful Beaton's Christmas Annual. It was one of the highlights of the 1887 annual, and it was from there that he was approached by uh, Strand magazine to, uh, to go and actually uh, make the Sherlock Holmes stories. The Holmes stories had come at the right time, and the readership grew rapidly, setting Conan Doyle and his creation on course to making publishing history. Well, I'm walking along Upper Wimpole Street off the Marylebone Road, and here on the left is number two Upper Wimpole Street. Because it was here that Conan Doyle set himself up as an eye specialist, but his patients were conspicuous by their absence. So as he sat there waiting for them to arrive, he began tinkering with the characters of Holmes and Watson. And this really is an important address as far as both Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes are concerned, because although perhaps not the birthplace of Sherlock Holmes, this is certainly the location where Sherlock Holmes began to mature. The Holmes short stories now took off and very quickly the circulation climbed to 500,000 and then the real proof emerged when publisher after publisher had to have their family magazines. So that in fact an entirely new world was created by Sherlock Holmes in a whole series of ways. He didn't think much of any of the other murder mystery story uh, tellers out there, and he was the first one who tried to construct it properly and tried to do the characterisation. So, and definitely it was the public feedback that just grew and grew and grew and made him so popular. By the time Conan Doyle was serialising Sherlock Holmes and the Strand, The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1901, and then later with The Valley of Fear, People were so hooked, they made sure they didn't miss an episode. In that sense, really, Conan Doyle prefigures some of the modern soaps. Not only had Conan Doyle arguably created the soap opera, but he had also definitely created a new kind of fiction. The Sherlock Holmes stories were the beginning of detective stories as a genre, and they were in their way the beginning of what we see now mostly on television. <laughs>
the modern day detective fiction novel and uh, play or television series is mainly based on the formula put forward by Kern Doyle. Not just the fact that it's two characters, it's also the fact of the deductive reasoning and so on. Uh, without that you probably wouldn't have the very popular CSI series. It certainly wouldn't be unfair to say that Conan Doyle is the father, if not the godfather, of all modern detective fiction. The new innovation of the detective story was taking the literary world by storm, in a world filled with the likes of Edgar Allan Poe and Robert Louis Stevenson. They may have all used detective characters and the mystery story to bring their works to life, yet many are now forgotten. It was the original quality of Sherlock Holmes that would give birth to the coming revolution in literature based on mystery and detective work. Watson and, and Holmes were the first detective pair. And since then, virtually every other successful detective has been a pair. Poirot and Hastings, and it's often said, you know, they must be descendants of Holmes and, and, and Watson. Generally, the, the formula these days is to have a detective pair. One clever, one not so clever. However, Conan Doyle's likeable and believable characters are matched by equally unlikable characters. Careful studies of the darker manifestations of human nature. What was it in Victorian society, or indeed Conan Doyle, that created characters like Moriarty? Were they based on some perceived evil in society that the writer had identified? These are villains that are as full-blooded and lifelike as the hero himself. It's also very significant that the villains are normally middle-class or aristocratic figures. The ruffian with the blunderbuss is not the problem. It's figures who should be helping to make society, keep society safe, who are in fact exploiting and destroying it. Moriarty is something of a, a mythical figure. He's always there on the edge. But he's not evil, although Holmes, I think, describes him as evil. What really seems to have inspired Conan Doyle to depict thoroughly bad characters uh, is actually domestic violence, the probable influence of his own father's alcoholism and any violence that that might have given rise to within his own family. And we do see that in the, the stories, and that is actually more horrifying, certainly to the, the present day reader, than Professor Moriarty's ingenious schemes. I do think there is certainly uh, a, a better link there because people in those times, they weren't so sophisticated and there was great superstitiousness among the general public who wanted to believe in things like ghosts and spectral hounds and so on. So there I think it did feed upon what the public um, either expected existed or, or hoped might exist. It seems then that what made him such a phenomenon as the Edwardian Age dawned was that the stories had captured a popular mood and that most could identify strongly with the adventures of Holmes and Watson. There was certainly an appetite in the, in the public for horrible murders. The horror, the apparently motiveless evil of the Jack the Ripper murders. Holmes was present not as an escapist figure, not telling escapist stories, but saying there are bad things happening, but they can be dealt with. And the stories are full of social tragedy, things which Holmes can only explain, and tragedies which he cannot remedy. That's one of the great things about the stories. They don't try to give you simply an entry into a world which doesn't exist. And you have a whole host of villains, all of which are perfectly characterised and perfectly painted for the reader, so they can actually believe in these characters. And again, it's because they were so believable that when he was killed off, that people thought he was a real person and, and wore the armbands in, in the street in his memory. It's not difficult to imagine the readership of the Strand magazine walking around their London, picking up their latest issue to read Holmes's latest adventures in a familiar setting that they knew and understood.
And such was his popularity that within a matter of months, Holmes had eclipsed his creator and it would be the fictitious Sherlock Holmes who would go on to achieve immortality, leaving his author with a dilemma. The question is, having created this whole world of characters, and in particular, having created the character of Sherlock Holmes, why did he choose to kill him off? To murder his own creation. Doyle was enjoying the newfound fame and financial success, yet as a writer was frustrated that his life was being devoted to and overwhelmed by the all-powerful Holmes character. He wanted to write serious fiction. By late 1891, Conan Doyle was growing tired of his creation and the parallel existence of the Sherlock Holmes character with his own life, perhaps feeling that Holmes was overshadowing his more serious work. I mean, the character did take over Conan Doyle's life without a doubt. Conan Doyle certainly had higher aspirations for his writing. The character of uh, Sherlock Holmes overtook the life of Conan Doyle. For some, Conan Doyle was perhaps not a writer in the grand tradition, and his Holmes creation had led him into the pulp fiction category. In this sense, it's not hard to understand how Holmes could have become bigger than he. In fact, I would say, again, I'll be contentious here, that he wasn't a literary person. I don't think he hardly read any other books at all. Even though he had a li library, I'm not actually sure he read anything. I don't think he was a well-read person. From what is known of his life and his influences, three possible reasons emerge for the writer's motivation in removing Holmes from his life. The simpler answer would perhaps relate to his feelings about himself as an author. The first reason being his ambition to do something a little more interesting. The second could be about his need to confront his own possible shortcomings as a truly great writer. Conan Doyle wants to be remembered not for this fictional creation, but more for his historical novels, his historical writing, his more serious work. And I think that's probably why he, he wanted to kill him off, and he was quite ambitious for himself. So although these books had made him a good career of money, he then wanted to go on and had higher aspirations. Conan Doyle was very pleased with his creation, but he felt certainly from halfway through the first series of short stories that uh, the home stories were hack work. They brought in the money. What he really wanted to do was to write stories of chivalry, of daring do. This is the sort of thing that he thought was really important. The third argument is perhaps more complex than the obvious, namely that he was tired of the character. Could it be that the darker aspects of his life were somehow bound up with his home's character? in a way that his creator could no longer tolerate. Overwhelmed by the Sherlock Holmes phenomenon, Conan Doyle was finally rejecting his dark alter ego and his early life experiences. There was perhaps just one other reason. There was, I think, nothing in Sherlock Holmes which Conan Doyle really disliked, but the stories are written unbelievably close to the surface. Conan Doyle wrote them at full steam. He made very few alterations in most of them after he had written them. That means that they were actually reflecting his own life much more, perhaps, than we realize. It's apparent that Conan Doyle was writing about the more difficult sides of his own life when he writes of alcoholism, drug addiction, and violence. It's not surprising, therefore, that having spoken of them, he should wish to dispose of them permanently through his fictional character. Even before he'd finished writing the first dozen stories, he told his mother that he wanted the last one to be absolutely the last. He wanted to kill Holmes off his mother said, You can't. You mustn't. You shan't. She knew a good thing when she saw one. However, his mother's words went unheeded. His creator was about to make the biggest decision of his career. Conan Doyle was rapidly coming to the conclusion that he must kill Sherlock Holmes. But how would he carry out the murder? Deciding on a radical solution to his dilemma, Conan Doyle wrote to his mother, informing her how he intended, winding him up for good and all. He takes my mind from better things. Conan Doyle did, in fact, write a second series, 
And at the end of it, he was absolutely determined to get rid of Sherlock Holmes. In The Final Problem, published in The Strand in December 1893, Holmes encountered Professor Moriarty, his arch enemy, for the last time in a mutually fatal showdown. Having been on holiday to Switzerland, he was introduced to the famous falls at Reichenbach, which he thought would make a splendid resting place for poor Sherlock. However, getting rid of Holmes was not to prove as easy as he had first planned. He said that he fully intended to leave him there, quote, even if I buried my banking account along with him. And the public, of course, were not happy with that at all. The decision was to rob the Victorian public to the core. After the final problem had gone to print, Doyle received letters from distraught readers in tears. They could not let Holmes go. When Holmes was killed off in the final problem, uh, actually some of the city workers went around London wearing black armbands in memory of Sherlock Holmes, thinking that he was a real character. And the sales of Strand magazine then plummeted. Members of the royal family were said to be distraught and there was a mass revolt from the general public with the Strand magazine and Conan Doyle as their targets. What is certainly true is that the publisher, the editor and the author received angry letters from readers. Conan Doyle gleefully quotes one in his autobiography from a lady. It began, you brute! The fears of Conan Doyle's mother were soon realized as 20,000 readers canceled their Strand magazine subscription, outraged by the death of their detective hero. Conan Doyle was overwhelmed by the reaction. I was amazed at the concern expressed by the public. However, he was soon to be distracted from this public uproar by personal tragedy, which would shake the author's world to its foundations. His wife, Louisa, was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Conan Doyle chose to nurse her himself, and his dedication and devotion kept her alive into the 20th century. But this would be only the first in a series of blows for the writer. With the death of his father, Charles, and later his son, Kingsley, in the great 1914-18 war. It may have been these combined stresses that sowed the seeds for the author's new passion for the occult and spiritualism the belief that the spirits of the dead can communicate with the living, or, as he termed it, life beyond the veil. Seeking comfort for these personal tragedies, he became one of its greatest exponents. But the next development of his life was to prove that he was still on top of his game as the supreme writer of detective fiction. For the next eight years, Doyle excluded Holmes from his life and concentrated on his other work. But in 1901, he had an idea for perhaps his most legendary work to date, one that would leave its mark for generations to come. But this novel needed a detective. He didn't want to create a new character. Why not use Holmes? The Hound of the Baskervilles was a landslide success and remains one of the most frequently performed stories today. What he didn't do then was bring Holmes back to life. He presented The Hound of the Baskervilles as an adventure that had occurred before the events at Reichenbach Falls. An American publisher said, name your figure. So Conan Doyle named a figure that he thought was way too high and would just send the American publisher packing. And the publisher turned around and said, fine, when are you going to send the first one? This made Conan Doyle I think it's still true today, the highest paid author per word in existence. Uh, he might have been overtaken, I guess, by J.K. Rowling, but uh, there's very few others who can uh, make that claim. The Hound's reception showed that the passion for this great detective was as strong as ever. Inevitably, the story was so popular, it was suggested that he might actually think about bringing Holmes back to life. And after all, as someone pointed out, he provided Holmes with a death that didn't require a body to be produced. Finally, Conan Doyle surrendered to the public demand for more Holmes stories. In 1903, he resurrected Holmes in the empty house, with an explanation of how Holmes had not really plunged into the falls after all. <laughs> 
Well, there's one or two opinions on the significance of the, the mystery years or the great hiatus as it's known. But to explain the absence, Conan Doyle had Holmes going off by himself, meeting the Dalai Lama and doing various other things for crown heads of Europe and so on. And, and basically, we, we could say going to find himself, having a, a sabbatical for a few years. But in reality, Holmes had never really gone away. Shortly before his re-emergence, an entrepreneurial American actor, William Gillette, expressed an interest in reviving the Holmes character by playing the part on stage. However, Gillette wanted to update the story, and with some apprehension, he wrote to Conan Doyle, humbly putting forward some minor changes. William Gillette actually wrote to Conan Doyle and said, uh, may I marry Sherlock Holmes off? Conan Doyle was so disinterested by this time, he said, you, you may do with him, you know, whatever you want to. And he did. This reaction to Gillette seems to suggest the continuing, complex relationship which Conan Doyle had with the character he had created. When the actor arrived in England and met with Doyle to read the almost completely revised play to him, Conan Doyle gave him his full attention, and as the meeting drew to a close, spent a moment in thought. His announcement is as revealing as it is contradictory. It's good to see the old chap again. I think Conan Doyle's relationship with his, his character, certainly towards the end of, of his life, was more of a Jekyll and Hyde relationship. And on the one side, he probably quite loved the character because it gave him power, it made him well known, it gave him money, of course. But on the other side, it detracted from what he really wanted to do, which was the spiritualism and his historical writings and so on. So it was very much a double-edged sword for him and a love-hate relationship. This was 1914. Conan Doyle could not have known that the fictional world he had created was soon to be eclipsed by tragedy, and the old order that the writer had known was to be lost in the trenches of northern France. With the outbreak of World War, Conan Doyle's personal life was to be tragically changed. It was to the spiritualist movement that Conan Doyle would turn again. Conan Doyle's interest in spiritualism didn't really flourish, I suppose, until after the Great War, when both his son Kingsley and his brother Innes uh, were killed. Particularly he became a spiritualist because after World War I, he was so much aware of the people who had died because of it, including his son and his brother. He did a lot of travelling for spiritualism. He went to Australia, to America, giving lectures. He could write a story, get a good income from it, and then plough it back into what he really believed was his main purpose in life, to extend the message of spiritualism. Conan Doyle's legacy was to extend far beyond that which he could have imagined in creating the Holmes character. Through just a series of short adventure stories, he had given birth to a new popular culture, brought one of the most enduring heroes to a new generation of readers, and brought the science of deduction into the 20th century. Had this resolved his demons? Could Holmes now be left to fade away into obscurity? When he said that Holmes had retired to Sussex to keep bees, Conan Doyle himself received letters addressed to Sherlock Holmes' care of Arthur Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle continued writing Sherlock Holmes stories from time to time, almost till the end of his life. It was a mood of resigned acceptance. He would write a story and accept whatever figure slightly deranged publishers were willing to give him for it. Having murdered Holmes in the final problem, then resurrecting him and restoring him to public adoration, he decided simply to let his hero retire gracefully from London mirroring the author's own life at this time. For the world's greatest detective, long walks on the Sussex Downs and beekeeping would become the activities of Holmes's later years. And by 1927, Conan Doyle had decided that it was time for his creation to take his last bow. As he penned the last lines of the adventure of Shoscombe Old Place, it was clear that he had finally wearied of the great Holmes adventure. He broke it off, leaving the public wanting much more. He wasn't going to become a soap manufacturer. He wanted to go into new ways of writing and did. When the final stories were published in book form as The Case Book of Sherlock Holmes, 
Conan Doyle added his own farewell to his creation. I fear that Mr. Sherlock Holmes may have become like one of those popular tenors who, having outlived their time, are still tempted to make repeated farewell bows to their indulgent audiences. This must cease, and he must go the way of all flesh, material or imaginary. He died on July the 7th, 1930. A New York newspaper devoted its front page to him and treated its readers to the unintentionally humorous headline. Conan Doyle dies of Sherlock Holmes' fame. But it was the Daily Herald that delivered the most memorable announcement, confirming for many the extraordinary relationship that had now been established between author and creation. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is dead. Long live Sherlock Holmes. Doyle had left behind him an enduring and substantial legacy, the four novels and 56 short stories about his fictional detective. Ironically, his other writings are for the most part forgotten. It is perhaps significant that when Edinburgh wanted to honor the birth of its favorite son here on Piccadilly Place, they chose not a statue of Arthur Conan Doyle, but a statue of his creation, Sherlock Holmes. In death as in life, Conan Doyle was overshadowed or eclipsed by his famous creation. Indeed, with a cruel twist of irony, given that Charles' childhood was blighted by his father's alcoholism, the only true memorial to the birth of Conan Doyle here, aside from the rather nondescript plaque on the wall, is on the other side of the road, where we have a pub called the Conan Doyle. We're still faced with the fact that today people will think of Sherlock Holmes without thinking of Conan Doyle. It is unfair. Without Conan Doyle, there would have been no Sherlock Holmes. What is it about this eccentric 19th century detective that made him so unique? What is that extraordinary quality that makes him such a phenomenon? And why is he still relevant even today? What is it about him that still has the ability to hold our attention and pull in 21st century audiences with blockbuster movies and TV programs all over the world? It's curious, I suppose, that a character who was created more than 120 years ago should still be popular and still considered relevant. He's something of a bohemian, which appeals to the rebel in all of us. For the Victorian audience, Sherlock Holmes was seen in advance of his, his time, ahead of his time, in his deductions and his mannerisms and so on. For an audience in the 21st century, it's very much the reverse. He's seen as a link back in time to a, a, another, perhaps better time as people would, would perceive it. But where his values and where his instincts and where his deductions are equally valid now as they were then. Despite the passions that Sherlock Holmes raised over his fictional lifetime, in the years that have followed, and as interest in the stories have grown, a growing number have made claims that there was a real Holmes. The man, of course, is fictional. This at least seems certain, although there is a world that wills him to exist. We're attracted, I think, to something that's safely dangerous safely because it's back in the past, safely also because we know that Sherlock Holmes is there and he'll get us out of it. Whilst mystery and intrigue still surrounds the legend of Sherlock Holmes, there is something in these stories that makes the reader try to dig beneath the surface, to discover for themselves something larger than the stories. Perhaps the reason is simple. Doyle, or Watson, was a marvelous storyteller. The original Holmes adventures are still bestsellers and have been translated into more than 50 languages. The legend has evolved and taken on a life of its own, at the same time ensuring an unusual afterlife for both Holmes and his creator. Tourists still make their pilgrimage to Baker Street searching for the actual home of the great detective. But why do they still come and pay homage to Holmes? And, by default, Conan Doyle?
There is the fact that for modern audiences and modern readers and scholars, they will use it as a window looking back in time at the almost perfect characterization of the Victorian period, the types of characters, uh, places, and how things actually worked in Victorian society. Modern life over the last century or so has lost a lot of the certainties that we had before. Now, you don't know what's going to happen in the next year, five years, and you don't really know who you can trust either. And moving back to look for Sherlock Holmes, who is going to solve the problem and save the world, is quite a comforting thing to do. There is clearly something of Conan Doyle about Sherlock Holmes. Maybe it's just his humanity, the combination of the light and the dark together, something perhaps central to the makeup of every human. There is a little bit of Sherlock Holmes in us all, and there's also a little bit of us that would like to be transported back to this Victorian era of the fog-filled streets and so on, when everything was exciting. We had a British Empire was in its full stream in this little veneer, as it were, of, res of Victorian respectability that they would like to inhabit. But would Conan Doyle have been gratified by the immortality of his character in the face of his attempts to dispose of him? I wouldn't know the answer to that, but uh, there is something endearing about Holmes, I suppose, and, and Watson too, there are a couple of good friends who solve problems, and it seems that it's a formula that uh, uh, Doyle struck on and it, it worked. But the main relevance, really, is in the character of Sherlock Holmes. As I've said, the, the bohemian, the man we would perhaps all like to be. Whether he was aiming for such a close relationship is debatable. However, some do see Sherlock Holmes as Conan Doyle's voice on humanity, whether the author liked it or not. Sherlock Holmes continues to live, I think most of all, because when you get right down to it, human beings know that what differentiates them from animals are their mind, and Sir Sherlock Holmes is the celebration of mind. It is turning mind into a fascinating, believable, likeable, admirable figure. So long as we are going to be able to maintain ourselves as human beings, Sherlock Holmes seems justifiably likely to endure. When we respond to Sherlock Holmes, perhaps the truth is that we are responding to Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle may have been the man who murdered Sherlock Holmes, but both character and author live on in the minds of those who continue to read his works.